Well, my friends, we have been uh, these last few weeks in the book of Acts, and we continue there this morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16. And the last two weeks, we've talked about some incredible transformations that have happened, how God surprised the early church with uh, the things that God was up to. And so we had Paul, uh, who once was the greatest enemy of the church, becoming the greatest missionary. And then last week, we had Peter, who, uh, who uh, it was revealed to him that God's plan was much bigger than he ever thought. God didn't just come to save the Hebrew people, but actually his plan was to save everyone. And so now uh, these early church leaders are, are spreading the good news about Jesus. And the early church is taking off. This is in the first century A.D., uh, not too far after Jesus had died and rose again. And in Acts 16, we find Paul on one of his missionary journeys. And he has, uh, we'll, we'll say, his wingman, his sidekick, his partner in ministry, Silas, is with him on this part of the journey. And Paul and Silas are doing their work. They are spreading the good news. They are telling people about Jesus. And uh, as continues to happen on these, th- on these trips, they run into trouble. And they run into trouble because they are living out their faith. And that is not appreciated by everyone in the communities in which they're practicing and preaching. And so they uh, end up in jail and they go through quite a bit of suffering. And in the midst of this story, there's really some miraculous things that happen. But for me, what's, for me, what's most incredible is Paul and Silas's reaction to their circumstances. And, and I think this is a challenge for all of us because life happens around us all the time. And we might even sometimes feel like life happens to us or maybe even against us. And we find Paul and Silas who are doing their best to serve God. They are really doing incredible things serving God, and yet in the midst of that, they face incredible suffering. And the way that they respond to that, to me, is really incredible. And so I want us to notice that today, and and then hopefully we can challenge ourselves to how do we react to the things in our lives, not only the good things, but the hard things, and where do we see God at work in that? And ultimately, as you see on the sermon slide, I want us to think about what it means then to live from a place of spiritual abundance. Because I think that's what we find in Paul and Silas. So let's dive in in Acts 16, and we'll, we get a little precursor to how they, we, we find out why they end up in prison. So let's see what happens here. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they've come to tell you how to be saved. Well, this went on day after day, until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace, The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. I'll pause there for a moment. Um, Before we find out what happens, I want to just address this opening scene. This is really a side note to the message today, but I think it's important to address it a little bit, what's happening here. So, um, So we have these men who have a slave girl who they are using as their means of making money. We might call this trafficking, human trafficking. Um, Certainly, we would say this uh, seems to be a deplorable situation. In this culture, it's not uh, an an exceptional situation. Unfortunately, in this culture, uh, the slave trade and things like that were a normal part of life. Um, But what we see happening here is this woman being, this girl being exploited by these individuals, and ultimately what they are angry about is that uh, their exploitation will no longer reap them rewards. Isn't that too bad? But I also want to know what was happening here. Uh, According to the reading, this girl had a demon that allowed her to tell the future, to give fortunes. And I just want to speak to this for a moment. Um... 
you know, people have different, different thoughts around things like spirits and different thoughts around things like fortune telling and people who can talk to spirits and people who can tell the future. And I, I just want to give you my perspective on that quickly. And I think this is backed up by scripture. And that is this, that any time, first of all, scripture is pretty clear that that's not stuff for us to dabble with. It's not stuff for us to mess around with. And here's why. Anytime we are seeking information from spirits, anytime we are opening ourselves up, well, we create the opportunity for spirits to have access to us. And we can't control whether those spirits are from God or not. Okay, that's, that's the very basic level of this conversation. You get that? Like anytime you make yourself open. So for instance, I remember as a teenager um, dabbling with a Ouija board. Some interesting things happened there. Do I think a Ouija board is possessed? No, it's a piece of cardboard. But what are you doing when you use a Ouija board? You're inviting something to talk to you, right? That invitation can be a dangerous one. It's not the board itself. It's you making yourself open. Now, from a faith perspective, in the same way, our ability to connect with God is also dependent, I think, partly on us being open to God's presence. But do you see the, the equivalent there or the dark side of that? So um, just to be clear, uh, I, while I am not, I am not saying that uh, anybody who pretends to tell fortunes is a bad person, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but what I'm saying is as Christians, we don't dabble with that stuff. We just don't. We don't dabble with those things. It's, it's actually a dangerous thing to do, I believe. Spiritually, it's a dangerous thing to do, okay? So I just wanted to speak to that. But continuing on here, what's really interesting to me is that this girl follows them around saying, they're servants of the Most High God and they're going to tell you how to be saved. And she's just yelling this. And finally, Paul gets so exasperated that he's just like, I am done with this demon come out of her in the name of Jesus. And it's done and it's over with. The demon leaves her. She's lost her power. And then everything unravels. My, my understanding of this is that probably what was happening is she was this demon was being so obnoxious that it was preventing Paul and Silas from actually like having meaningful conversations with people. Like if I had somebody following me around like yelling at me, you'd be like, um, I'm finding somewhere else to go, right? You don't want any part of a conversation with me. I think that's what, what the issue was, is it prevented them from doing the kind of ministry they were trying to do. Um, now, I, I would say... Per, I, Personally, my first reaction is, well, why didn't he just do that to begin with? Because obviously, this is an, a situation of exploitation and a situation of spiritual bondage, and why didn't we just free this girl to begin with? That's a good question. Uh, but certainly, I think that's something for all of us to ponder and be aware of. Um, when peop where people are being exploited, where there might be um, demonic influence, we do want to be aware of those things. And notice here, though, what happened with Paul very powerful. He just commanded the spirit to leave in Jesus' name, and that was it. So interesting things happening here, interesting things. Obviously, that's a whole nother sermon or a whole nother sermon series, right? We could do all that. Um, so if you have questions about that, all that stuff, or you want more conversation, let me know. Be happy to, to have that conversation. But we're going to talk about something else the rest of this time this morning. So what happens when Paul and Silas get dragged before uh, the officials in the market? We pick up at verse 22. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Now, sometimes when we read scripture or read Bible stories, we just read it through quick, like, oh, that's a story, that's how it went. Let's stop and pay attention to what actually happened here. So Paul and Silas are ordered, are ordered to be thrown in prison, but what happens to them first? They're stripped and beaten. Okay, stripped means publicly humiliated. Publicly humiliated. And then as everyone's watching, beaten with wooden rods, severely beaten. Now just imagine yourself for a moment in that situation. Oh, we don't want to go there, do we? Right? 
I mean, this, this wasn't like a slap on the wrist and now here we're going to put some handcuffs on you and don't forget your rights. Here you go. Right? This isn't the American justice system. Okay, this is the Roman justice system. The Roman justice system. So these guys are severely beaten, stripped and severely beaten. Then when they're thrown in prison, how, what's the situation in the prison? Where are they put and how are they put there? Inner dungeon and their feet are put in the stocks, which means their feet are completely bound. They can't move. They can't go. They can't do anything. So they're likely still naked and severely beaten. So you can imagine they're bleeding. They're bruised all over. They're stuck in the inner dungeon. It's probably dark. And they're completely locked up. Okay, so are you with me? You're all with me. This is a serious situation. Now, ask yourself, you have just been serving God in the best way you know how to do it, and this is what you get for it. What are you thinking? Uh, different people, what are you thinking? Done with God? Forget you, man, if this is how you're going to treat me. Anybody else? Where are you? Where are you, God? Anybody else? What are you thinking in this situation? Vicki? Hmm. Wow. Vicki's wondering about your will to live, just giving up, saying, well, I guess this is how it ends. Anybody else? So Brett wonders if it's not actually an opportunity for your faith to grow, you're trusting God to grow. We're all going, yeah, right. <laughs> but right, when you're stuck in that place of you've got no other options, and as Brett said, hey, these guys have witnessed miracles. These guys have seen the power of God. They're right in the thick of it. They've seen it. And so perhaps they, anyway, um, are not at that breaking point because of what they really believe that God can do here, okay? But certainly we can imagine ourselves in their position, and, the, and we can imagine our own suffering and the hardships we've gone through in life. And we all know that getting to that place where we wonder where God is, we wonder what's going to happen next, we wonder if God even cares, all of those things, right? Right? What I, what I think is amazing in this story is their response, which is in line with what Brett is suggesting. And, and I, when we go through this today, what I don't want to say is, so, hey, we should all do this. But what I do want us to try to get as to understand how they are able to react the way that they do. And I wonder if that's also not something for us all to, um, to hold up as a route we want to go with our lives. But So let's see what happens here. My, my gut is Paul and Silas are resting deeply in God's trust because they've got no other choice. And so starting at verse 25, we continue. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Pause there. Middle of the night, in the midst of their suffering, what are they doing? They're praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners are listening. So in the midst of their suffering, they are being witnesses to God. In the midst of their suffering. So something else is going on for them that wouldn't be going on for most of us. Something different is going on for them in the midst of this suffering. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Now pause there again. So in this culture, the jailer has one job to do, keep everyone in the prison. And if the jailer fails at that job, the jailer's as good as done. 
And so this earthquake happens. The, the, jail, the jailer wakes up, comes running, and sees that the doors are wide open. And he's only got one thing possible that he can think, and that is, I'm, I'm done here. I'm done here. They've escaped. My life is now no good. So uh, understand his cultural perspective here. He thinks it's all over for him. Now, what's amazing to me is, once again, what happens with Paul and Silas, how they respond to all of this. Because if it's me, the door, if my chains fall off and the door's open, I'm assuming that God just did a miracle so I could get the heck out of there, and I'm booking it, right? I'm the first one out the door. <laughs> Better believe it. <laughs> Knock over my kids to get out that door. <laughs> Paul shouted to him, this is the jailer, Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourselves, we are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's an odd thing for a guy to ask, isn't it? It seems out of the blue, but let's understand the context. He, he can think of no other possibility in this moment of the doors being open, then he's got to kill himself because uh, his life is as good as over. And, and, and he cannot make sense of what's going on that these guys stayed put. In other words, what, he sees something in them that is so not normal that he wants to understand what, he, what this is about. In other words, there's something different about these guys. There's something super different, and I want to know what it is. I want to have what they have. I want to have what they have. Because clearly they are different than any other prisoners he's seen before. Something unique is happening here, and he wants it. So it's like saying, tell me your secret, is what he is saying to them. Tell me your secret. How are you like this when no one else is like this? How are you like this? So, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. So Paul and Silas began to tell them all about the good news. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. They brought, he brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Wow. Wow. Now, once again, in this culture, jailer would never invite scum like this, someone from the prison, into his home, right? But he is so moved by what he sees in them. He's so moved by how they are that he brings them into his home. He tends to their wounds, right? Tends to their wounds, brings them food, and then his whole family is baptized. They all become believers, now, this is a Roman, this is a Roman uh, who has nothing to do with the Christian faith. And his life is turned upside down. In fact, we might say the one who's actually set free from bondage here is the jailer. It's the jailer. So I'm guessing we can infer some things about Paul and Silas's character and integrity and faith based on their actions in this story, can't we? And my assumption is that uh, these guys... Paul and Silas, there's something special about them, and that, I think, is their relationship with God. And, you know, as we went through this series on called, we've talked that ultimately our core call is to learn to rest in Jesus. Remember we talked about the imagery of the tree planted by the river with its roots down deep that even in a drought, even in a drought, it's sucking up water of life and producing green leaves and fruit. Isn't that what we see in Paul and Silas? They're in one of the most worst imaginable positions you could imagine. But what are they doing? Oh, they're soaking up the good water. They've got it. They're full. They're still producing fruit. In the midst of suffering, they are producing fruit. It's incredible. And, and, and then as the story progresses, the way that they then turn this into an opportunity to minister, and they're now ministering to the jailer and his family, it's unbelievable. For me, that's this idea of living from a place of spiritual abundance. They 
are resting in God's mercy and grace and love. And when they need it most, they have direct access and they have it to share. What we're being reminded of here through Paul and Silas is that we can serve God's will in any situation, that God can use us as vessels of God's grace in any situation. And even when we think we have uh, nothing to offer, even when we think we are at the end of our ropes, God can still use us in incredible ways. Surprise, surprise. We can be vessels of divine grace even when we are in dire straits. You know, one of the most powerful things about the Christian message and about who Jesus is and what God has done for us is that God is with us not only in the glory of the resurrection, but also at the foot of the cross. That God is with us in all of it. In all of it. And it's actually in death that God made victory over death. It was in Jesus' death that God gives us all eternal life. Incredible. It's incredible. So today I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to think about your own reaction to suffering in your life. I know it's easy for me to say when I'm, things seem to be going well for me. I realize that. But we're challenged today to consider where we rest in these times. What's our source of life? And what do we choose to do with every moment we have? And it's completely human to have a wide range of emotions, a wide range of reactions. All that's completely human. And I don't think any of it's wrong. But Paul and Silas lift up to us that God can use us no matter what. And in fact, we might find a whole other way of living in the midst of those times if we're willing to rest in God's love and grace and mercy. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are challenged by Paul and Silas today. We're challenged by their deep trust in you. We're challenged by their response to their suffering. We're challenged by their willingness to serve you in all circumstances. God, we thank you that you stop at nothing to love us and save us. We're thankful that you promise to be with us in all circumstances and situations. And we ask today that you help us to turn to you always. To trust that you can give us more than we have in ourselves. We pray that you help us to grow our roots down deep so that we can always have that direct access to the life you give to us. May we be your vessels in all that we do. Even when we're angry, even when we're hurting, even when we're grieving, even when we're suffering. May we know that you are with us and we have your love to share. It's in Jesus' name we pray.